morning and welcome to Rising, another big show to get to today covering all the latest news with what's going on in Israel, uh, given the attacks that occurred over the weekend. So I think we're going to get right to it. Take uh, us away. That's right. Well, Robbie, President Biden is reportedly weighing tying legislation for more military support for Israel with military assistance for Ukraine, setting up what could be a massive showdown with House Republicans. In the days following this weekend's deadly attack by Hamas, Israel has targeted the Gaza Strip in a series of counter-strikes. The strikes have exhausted medical supplies in the region and displaced over 200,000 Palestinians. As of this morning, over 2,500 people have been confirmed dead in the fighting, including 11 Americans. President Biden warned more U.S. citizens are likely among the old told number of hostages taken by Hamas. Meanwhile, Secretary of State Antony Blinken tweeted and then deleted a statement calling for a ceasefire between the IDF and Hamas, which could be a sign that U.S. backing for the Israeli military action is, in fact, very, very solid. The White House was lit up in the colors of the Israeli flag overnight in a show of the Biden administration's support on the remaining questions of how intelligence organizations missed the Hamas attacks in the first place. Egyptian intelligence officials are alleging that Israel ignored repeated warnings warnings of, quote, something big. One Cairo official said Israel is focused on West Bank instead of Gaza, a claim which Netanyahu's office denies. This is according to a Times of Israel report. And new this morning, Russian President Vladimir Putin has made his first public comments on the Israel-Palestine war. He said it is, quote, a clear example of the failure of the United States policy in the Middle East for not, quote, taking into account the fundamental interest of the Palestinian people and the need to implement the decision of the U.N. Security Council on the creation of an independent, sovereign Palestinian state. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Maybe first, um, this... This question of the aid and how the aid is going to be um, kind of pushed through, we're going to talk about this a little bit later in the context of a uh, Tucker Carlson weighing in on this. But it has been really interesting to see the kind of anti-war, anti-funding zealousness that has come to characterize a very popular segment of the Republican Party completely turn heel on this particular issue. Yes. And and by turn heel, you know, we're talking about many of the Republican leaders and political figures. Um, I don't know that that reflects any turning or changing of minds of the base of actual Republican right. voters, because what we find out time and time again is that there are hawks uh, running and leading both parties who just assume, or maybe they do know better, maybe they know that their views are not popular or they're naive about it, and they want to, you know, push f- forward with an interventionist military aid package kind of plan that is never super popular with their actual supporters. And I suspect this will be another case, which again is not to say that um, that that it is not right or proper to be horrified by the ongoing violence, by the harming of of innocent civilians on both sides of this conflict. Um, I, I think, I'm, I'm sure many, if not the overwhelming majority of Americans, are moved by the images they're seeing on social media and and lament it. Um, but, but in the immediate wake of a crisis, there is so much opportunity for bad policy. And we have seen the U.S. stumble into bad foreign policy uh, in the wake of violent attacks time and time and time again. Actually, I saw Senator Rand Paul bringing up that point um, on uh, Fox News last mm-hmm. night, being interviewed about it, and saying, you know, he was being asked about Iran's culpability in all this, and he's saying, look, he, he he accepts that Iran does have some culpability here, but we need to have an investigation. Remember when all our intelligence officials supposedly assured the Bush administration that Iraq and Hussein were involved in 9/11, and we you know leading us into a war that totally destabilized the region on some bad intelligence. So you can be angry, you can be shocked, you can be horrified, you can be upset, but sober policy needs to take hold. So everyone should calm down and think about what is really in the best interest of U.S. national security and and consider what the people actually want. Yeah, and it's not just, by the way, kind of Republican leadership that, or the establishment Republicans who have offered a kind of an accelerationist view of this conflict, even people like Tulsi Gabbard, who really made her bones being the more 
sanguine, like measured peace candidate, tweeted out a response yesterday that I think maybe surprised some folks, where she said, you know, the U.S. must stand with Israel in the face of this terror attack by the Islamist terrorist group Hamas. This is just the latest example of a greater war being waged by both Sunni and Shia Islamist jihadists throughout the world. This should be a wake-up call to leaders everywhere that Islamist, sorry, it's a tongue twister the number of times she says Islamist jihadists in this tweet, are the greatest short and long-term threat to the safety, security, and freedom of the American people and people throughout the world. And it really does, and we'll talk about this more later, stand in, in contrast to people like, of all people, Tucker Carlson, who've been asking a lot of more measured questions, the likes of which you expect to find on the American left, about some of the root causes of this conflict. Uh, speaking of, we referenced this yesterday, but it's worth um, getting into now that the crisis has continued to unfold, that an, uh, Riz, uh, an Israeli politician, um, Yoav Gallant, is now infamous on the internet for using what has been described uh, as genocidal language uh, characterizing what Israel's response to the Hamas attacks should be. He called for a, quote, complete siege of the Gaza Strip, which, of course, is home to 2.2 million Palestinians. Half the population there is children. I think the mean age is 14 years old. And cutting off electricity, food, fuel, everything is closed. He said, we are fighting human animals and we act accordingly. And many people have pointed out that that kind of mass response targeting civilians in that way is a war crime, as, of course, was killing the civilians uh, by Hamas in Israel, a war crime. And so then what is the public response when we, of course, are funding uh, Israel with so many billions of dollars a year, as their senior officials are explicitly saying that they plan to use weaponry that, of course, is bolstered by our support to commit a, a massive war, uh, war crime on a restrained, basically imprisoned population that is disproportionately children. Yeah. I, I, so I saw someone, uh, I think, libertarian-aligned, saying on social media, you know, imagine if there was a, a, a gang in your neighborhood who had committed violence in a, in a, in a neighboring neighborhood, then came back to your neighborhood and were hiding there, and the police just started shutting off the lights and the water to everyone, mm -hmm. you'd be pretty, I mean, you'd be pretty upset from a property rights standpoint about your rights being violated. And people need to, you know, take that into consideration while still obviously recognizing that um, Israel is going to take action to, you know, to, <laughs> to attack, kill, detain, arrest the, uh, the militants who were involved in this, who, you know, took, who, Violated, you, you know, bring up the Geneva Court, violated human rights, or have taken um, civilians hostage and are, you know, using hostages in, in negotiation, something um, that is not that modern civilized nations are not supposed to do. Yeah, one interesting thing about U.S. coverage that some commentators have noted is that what is considered to be a really controversial, um, provocative, even left wing view here in the United States is the kind of debate that's happening very publicly on the front pages of some of Israel's main newspapers. So there was um, someone had pointed out that the discourse in, uh, I believe I might be mispronouncing it, Haaretz, uh, a major mm -hmm. newspaper there, was openly on the front page hosting editorials and op-eds and dis discussions about the role that imprisoning a population of two million basically in the middle of your country, on the edge of your country, what well, the consequences of that absolutely are and what role that occupation is going to play in moments of violence like the ones happened over the weekend. And isn't it in the best interest of the citizens of Israel to no longer keep people in a pressure cooker that is such an occupied territory? But what you're seeing a lot of in the United States is very similar to what we saw in the context of the Ukraine crisis, where the word unprovoked was bandied about a great deal in the hours and days after the attacks first happened in a way that seemed to cut off any of the precipitating factors. And again, if you do that, what hope can there be of ever remedying the situation sure. and getting to a level set? Sure. Although we know, we know from talking to them, we know from them stressing their views that many, many Israelis want a different policy toward the Palestinians than their government has given that, you know, I, I'm sure most people on both sides of this conflict don't hate each other and want to live together in peace. And it's unfortunate that relevant policymakers on one side and then a, and a terrorist group on the other have, um, have taken actions that escalate violence and cause innocent, unconnected people um, to suffer and die on, on both sides. And in fact, it's worth noting that part uh, of the reporting that's come out, again, of some of these Israeli papers, is about the role Benjamin Netanyahu played specifically in 
basically pied pipering Hamas over more secular, less, I don't know, a, a, a way to say it, extremist mm -hmm. groups in Palestine, knowing, articulating, this I think came out of some of the WikiLeaks releases, that if you want um, you know, if you want a continued occupation, the best way to do that is to have a militant group that is a good face for us to continue to oppress the Palestinians. You don't want a more measured, um, publicly acceptable political group, whether it's the PLO or some other more secular. Yeah, I saw some people on uh, Twitter um, <clears throat> resuscitating those claims. I, it, they've been reported in, in the Wall Street Journal yes. um, that it, former uh, Israeli intelligence officials involved with that um, talking about, yes, just that, their own efforts to um, to to bolster um, Hamas it's, it's, as a more, yeah. a, in order to delegitimize the Palestinian It does such a disservice, opposition. of course, right. as we're seeing now with all the violence that erupted over the weekend and all of the Israeli lives that, that have been lost, it does an incredible service to the people that he's supposed to be safeguarding as a leader of that, of that country. So uh, I'm sure we'll continue to find out more as uh, the conflict uh, develops. I don't see any uh, regrettably end in sight. So stick with us and we'll have more rising for you right after this.